I think it's really important that if you're a hacker, if you're a developer, you balance the excitement that you have around a new technology, around a new potential problem to solve with the opportunity in the market and building a sustainable business. If you build one without the other, if you have a great business plan or you have some amazing idea but it's not feasible technically, then you're not going to get very far. And I actually think the inverse is true. You can build amazing tech, but if you hadn't thought through the market for it or the value proposition it offers, whether it's a market we're used to or whether it's a completely new market that doesn't mimic anything today, if you haven't made a call on that side of the business, that can make your life very challenging as well. Welcome to the Hacker Noon Podcast. I'm your host, Trent Lipinski. In this episode, I sit down with Julian Moncada. He's working in the venture capital space and investing in a wide range of emerging technologies. In this episode, we dive into what some of these emerging technologies are from AR, VR, AI, to the blockchain and ICO space. So stay tuned. Hey, Hacker. Sorry to interrupt this great podcast. It's David Smook, founder and CEO of Hacker Noon and we're raising money for the first time, and we're doing it from the people. If you wanna buy shares in Hacker Noon, visit hackernoonshares.com. Help us make the best place for tech professionals to publish. Welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Julian. Tell us a bit about who you are and what you're working on. Hey there, I'm Julian Moncada. I'm an investor here in New York City. I work for a seed stage firm called Lair Hippo Ventures. We are one of the most active seed stage firms in the country. You know, by seed, I mean that we typically invest when a company is raising, you know, their first or second round of capital, typically rounds of anywhere from a couple hundred K all the way up to a few million dollars. And because we focus on seed, we really have a quite diverse portfolio. So we invest in a variety of sectors. On a high level, we have a number of investments kind of that are consumer facing and a bunch that are B2B. But we also have investments, you know, more specifically in sectors as broad as SaaS, consumer commerce, consumer software, emerging tech fields such as robotics, all the way down to, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency. So we have investments kind of in a variety of sectors and geographies. So we're, we're based here in New York. We have a great portfolio of investments in New York, and we kind of consider ourselves ourselves New York first investors in that we want to be one of the firms that makes up the backbone of the city, but we have a variety of investments in San Francisco, LA, and even in Canada, across the US, and even some international ones. We're a fairly diverse investor, and I've been here for about four years. So uh, I've gotten the pleasure of working with a variety of founders as well as companies, and also had the opportunity to look at a number of different areas. And you're kind of unique because you actually have a little bit of a development background yourself. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's kind of funny you ask. I mean, I grew up in the Midwest. So for me, tech was something that was always interesting, but never kind of low hanging fruit in terms of something that I considered a career path. And it wasn't until I got to college that I started meeting some folks at school who were developers or designers. And it was really towards the back half of college. And it was right kind of after the iPhone had come out and I started to have a lot of creative ideas, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners have had around interesting apps that should be built. You know, as, as some people have experienced, I started spending time with different friends of mine who were designers, developers, pitching them ideas, hoping that they would build them with me. And oftentimes you'd get kind of responses that were interested, but didn't pick up much traction in the form of actual partnerships. So it's kind of a funny story I got into it because I was actually on my way to go to a conference in like May and to pitch one of my apps to a bunch of developers amongst other people and, and hopefully find someone to work with me on it. It was like May 2nd and somehow the flight that I was on got canceled because of snow, which is a little ridiculous given the time of year. I was living in Minnesota at the time. And I remember very specifically kind of sitting in my basement thinking, this is terrible. Like I have this app idea. I really want to see it through and kind of limited by my inability to code. And I'm sure a lot of people have been there before. So like immediately, I just, I don't know, I think at the time I logged on a tree house or something and started just going at it and, and teaching myself as best I could to code and kind of jump right into iOS stuff. And so started building, admittedly very simple apps, but, you know, building some things in, in Objective-C. And, uh, I really loved it. I've been doing it for years now. And it's always been something I do independently. And I guess you could say I'm self-taught or I, I definitely am self-taught. But I think it's informed a lot of what I'm able to do at my firm, both as an investor, as well as kind of an advisor to some of our companies. 
does it kind of dictate a little bit and, and like give you a little extra insight into some of the startups and the projects that you're working on since you could actually technically understand a little bit of what they're doing and what they're trying to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, it, sometimes it's just me nerding out with some of our founders, like how are you trying mm-hmm. to make this decision versus that decision? But it certainly does. You know, I think especially for some companies, the tech that they use can really influence your business model. So to give you an example, like there was a time where a bunch of people were building bots and building kind of different apps that leverage messaging infrastructure to perform. And it was interesting because we really saw like a big proliferation of those bots, particularly on Facebook and a bunch of apps that were messaging, specific messaging apps. And I think there was a good amount of people who kind of wondered, well, why don't these just exist on SMS? And now at the time, my friends and I, for fun, were kind of toying around with some of that tech and we're thinking of launching kind of an SMS bot. And what we quickly discovered is that having a bot service that doesn't make any money on that uses an API like Twilio's is actually quite expensive. And so you're much more incentivized as a developer to use a Facebook or use kind of a platform that might not charge you for SMS service. Unfortunately, like at the time, we kind of went down the rabbit hole of trying to build our own Twilio-like like backend to do this for us. And we realized that was super difficult. And, and if you actually do want to deliver SMSs to kind of everyone in the world, on no matter what carrier they're on or what cell phone they're using, it's actually pretty hard to build the tech to do that. And it almost implies that you should pay someone to give you that ability. You know, that really informed even just how I looked at that space. I mean, just a direct experience where I kind of thought to myself, all right, I see how this app is doing. Some of these bots had business models, some didn't. And I was able to kind of look back on it kind of think about how the process we'd gone through and try to understand like whether focusing kind of an omni-channel or on one channel for messaging was going to make sense. So, I mean, that's just one example. There's a bunch of examples that really helps. At the, at the very least though, I think it gives me a lot of empathy for the folks actually building the product <laughs> and companies and yeah. I think it's taught me and something I learned as soon as I started developing is that the reason going back to kind of my story, the reason that a lot of my friends didn't dive right in to help me with my ideas is they're a lot of work. And I think it's easy to overlook that, that every kind of product decision or every tech decision you make or, you know, new idea that pops into a late person's mind is going to be hours and hours of work on, on someone else. What kind of trends are you seeing right now in the investment space? Are you seeing a shift between different technologies right now? There's been a lot of talk, obviously, about AR, VR. AI, obviously, is a pretty hot topic right now in Silicon Valley. Obviously, there's blockchain as well and ICOs. Is there any particular thing that you're focusing on right now or that's really got your attention? You know, I spend a lot of my discretionary time on emerging tech for our firm. And so we made investments across all of those verticals from VR to AI to blockchain. Right now, the innovation happening in the blockchain space is incredibly exciting. The excitement's almost like matched with more excitement for the uncertainty of what's actually going to work and what's going to end up really changing our lives. So to me, that jumps out as a space where I spend a lot of my time. But equally, I'm, we're, I work closely with some of our companies in AI and in VR, and I really love what they're doing. I think those are industries that are a little more, it's almost like the value they're creating and the progress is almost a, a little more subdued versus compared to industries like blockchain, where inherently people are going out and kind of rallying these networks of users or potential users. And so I think sometimes they get left behind. People kind of forget that there's a lot of interesting innovation happening in AI and VR at the startup level. But that's something that if you dig beneath the surface and if you actually spend time with some of these teams, you're able to really see and you're able to ultimately like appreciate and kind of see that the future for VR, for what we imagine VR to look like, or AR, immersive tech, is actually a lot closer, or at least, you know, on the horizon closer than a lot of people think. Hey, hackers, do you have a timely tech story you want to get published? Maybe you recognize the way certain systems trend affecting our everyday lives or have a vision of the future for the blockchain technology. Maybe you're on the field of play and know what it takes to make a great team or how to remain agile in today's competitive tech-rich environment. Share your expertise with the community at large on Hacker Noon. Email us, stories at hackernoon.com, and a real human will review your submission. just having this conversation actually with another guest recently on the show. And we were talking about how the hardware is actually there, but the software isn't. There's actually kind of a mismatch right now where we finally have the hardware for a lot of the VR and AR stuff. Take the iPhone XS or whatever the hell they're calling these things yeah. now. You know, the hardware is there. They just now have the APIs so that you can actually use multiple devices to see the same augmented reality item. And that was just a software limitation. That wasn't even necessarily hardware. Right. So we're just 
just now starting to see the APIs and some of the initial software we need to be able to take advantage of this hardware. But you could do this with an iPhone 7 or 8. You could do a lot of this stuff already back then, but the software wasn't really there and it wasn't quite optimized. And then when it comes to like actual VR, where you're creating an entirely immersive world, that's a totally much larger project to go build because you're having to literally create a physics engine and you're having to determine the artistic level of that world and your, your world building at that point, which takes a lot of time, energy, money, and resources. Yeah, I mean, um, I think with both of those spaces, you're totally right. I mean, we actually have a company called Janus VR that lets you host and build virtual worlds using a native client and a native protocol that they have that makes it a lot easier to kind of use HTML, CSS, JavaScript like languages to build. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it even more accessible, you know, because I think there's a knowledge gap inherent to coding and Unity or an Unreal. You know, so they, they've kind of laid this groundwork. And one of the things I noticed from working with them is that we're also just figuring out not just the use cases, but like the UX, you know, the paradigms for these different kind of formats. And so I've seen some amazing demos in VR and in AR, things that really make me kind of make my jaw drop, frankly, in terms of both how they're able to retro retrofit old iPhones or old piece of hardware to provide interesting experiences or, you know, new piece of hardware. But I think that the patterns haven't emerged quite yet, or at least they haven't proliferated to such an extent where we all know what a great experience would look like in AR and VR. And that's actually something like going back to the development stuff. I mean, that's something that I, that you get in iOS, you know, you, when, when you're making an app, you on Apple's developer site and they have a handbook for like how you should design apps. They have frameworks, for what an alert button should look like. They have a ton of different ready set recipes that you can plug into and, and it doesn't make it easy to make apps, but it certainly helps you make fewer decisions and at least and the decisions you do make get to feel a lot, you know, are, are usually the most impactful ones. With VR, we're still figuring out a lot of those standards and those best practices. You know, hopefully some of the some of the companies in the space like Oculus and like Apple, if they enter the space and Google and others will show support. I think that's a, to, the, to the space and kind of develop some of those standards. But it, you know, it's probably also going to fall on startups to be the first in the market with interesting UXs, interesting experiences, interesting value propositions, and then we'll see standards emerge. Well, you bring up a really interesting point about the UI UX of it as well, because you almost have to go back to like skeuomorphic design, because like when the iPhone first came out, anyone who had like the first models of the iPhone, you, you'll probably remember that all the icons and they had felt type graphics and all the apps were designed to mimic a real world device. The user interface was built in a way that if you've used a radio before, then you can figure out how to use the music app. We've now evolved to a point where like the user interface guidelines have changed on iOS and people kind of get the idea of, oh, that's a button now I can touch that. So we don't have to have that skeuomorphism. I mean, that was a big thing back in the early days of iOS and Apple was, is skeuomorphic design necessary? And like there were some debates in the UI UX community about it. But we almost need to go through that again for VR and AR because, you know, we need to figure out and almost train people on how to use these different technologies and these different user interfaces. And we almost have, there's like, it's almost like a reset where you have to kind of start over again and like maybe go back to a little bit of skeuomorphism so that people can learn and adapt to these new, you know, these new user interfaces. You know, I think back to like Minority Report and like, you know, being able to like control things with your hand and like, you know, have your whole desktop be, you know, a computer system that you can, you know, touch and manipulate and like do all these things with. But when you really think about it, like there has to be some standardized design so that, you know, if I go to your house and use your computer, I know how to use it. And if you come to my house and use my computer, you know how to use it. Even if we're using, you know, VR and augmented reality, uh, there needs to be some kind of unified, you know, experience so that, you know, there's, just a basic usability for people to be able to use these systems between, you know, different use cases and different applications. And those don't exist yet. And it, and it, gets, even, it gets even more complicated than, you know, the front end, if you will, that we know today. Like one of the, uh, a lot of innovations happening in the 3D audio space uh, where different mics are coming out that can capture kind of the 3D audio and different uh, software interfaces are coming out to help you mix and play sound in different kind of th in different locations. And, uh, you know, that's just a whole new skill set. We're even used to the headphones that, you know, you're wearing right now or that people may be listening to this on. You're just dealing with two channels. You're dealing with something on, you know, with your right and left channel. And you're, it actually is a little bit of work that, you know, the way the science works, your brain kind of has to work to, 
hear where something is and kind of place it. And for the most part, you're almost just, your brain's just going to default to everything's in front of me. In VR, uh, in, in, in particular, and in AR, um, you know, you're able, it's, you can really have an amazing experience if you place things behind someone, if you place things on top of someone, you know, it can both, both inform storytelling, it can inform their UX, it can inform the world they interact with. But from a strict, like, going back to kind of standards, like mixing that or, you know, layering that on top of software is a whole, you know, it requires a whole other set of software, a whole other set of hardware, and a whole other, you know, level of expertise. Um, I, on that topic, you know, I, of audio, I, I kind of think to, um, a lot of kind of music gear cause I play with, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm for fun also play music and there's a whole proliferation of hardware happening right now in the music space, it's super exciting and software. Um, but, uh, what, what one quickly learns is that as soon as you get a new instrument or even if it's a, a synthesizer, that's somewhat similar to another one in function. If its interface is different, you have to spend quite a lot of time learning how to play, kind of learning how to, you know, uh, use it in the way you'd like and, and ultimately kind of have solid creative output through it. And, and it takes a lot of kind of reading and learning. So I used to think that, you know, users should have a blank canvas and ultimately every developer should be able to make whatever piece of, um, you know, kind of software they'd like with whatever design guidelines they'd like. I mean, I, I can totally understand why some developers don't like, you know, how stringent Apple used, used to be and they still, you know, how they still kind of are around what's best, what are best practices or, you know, the fact they take a stance at all. But, um, but now having kind of both developed a little bit and also used kind of been an experience where I'm using, seeing a bunch of different UIs, I actually understand why, you know, it's, it's, it's a pain on the user to have to pick up a manual um, almost as if they're like getting a piece of Ikea furniture every time they want to use something and get some, get a productive, you know, experience out of something. Um, so, so I, I think kind of that balance is one that all fields of emerging tech going back to like VR, AR, but even in other spaces like blockchain, if you think of decentralized applications, you need to strike that balance. Trying, you need to strike that balance between creativity as well as between kind of standardization and something that feels familiar. Hey, yo, you got a great tech story you want to get published? Maybe something about bots taking over Twitter or how Bitcoin actually works? Or maybe you just have a story about how to build a great software, or a great team. Get your expertise published on Hacker Noon. Email us stories at hackernoon.com and a real human will review your submission. Frameworks and APIs help, um, yeah. you know. It, you know, especially when you you get into like the blockchain space and what's happening with decentralized tech and decentralized networks. I mean, we're still at the networking layer, really, when it gets, you know, when you get down to what's happening with blockchain. Um, it's an infrastructure play still. Uh, you know, the best companies that I've seen in the space are they're really focusing on how do we build a better decentralized network first, because that's kind of the foundational piece that you need to be able to then later run all these complex decentralized applications without a solid network to be able to build that on. Um, you know, you can't really, you can't really build that killer app. So you need to be able to take advantage of a network that's fully hashed out all of these complexities and that scales properly. Uh, and that does a lot of this stuff for you so that the app developers can go focus on building the features and functionality that's in their application that takes advantage of what the network can do rather than having to start over and create their own network every single time they want to create a decentralized app. Totally. I, I agree. And, and I think it's really interesting because there's a lot of conversation in the blockchain space, um, you know, around uh, whether, you know, recently, you know, Union Square Ventures published a post about whether we are in fact in the infrastructure age or whether, App, uh, the first, you know, next set of killer apps have to emerge that demand better infrastructure and and basically what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the application or the infrastructure. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the challenges is that I think at least personally what we're finding is people are building infrastructure for almost inferred applications. Uh, the, you know, a simple example um, would be Bitcoin you know, Bitcoin versus Ethereum debate and the fact that a lot of people kind of think that, you know, maybe the Bitcoin community is just moving too slow or maybe, you know, and conversely, some people think the Ethereum community is moving too fast. But sometimes I think they're just, 
without being reductive about an entire community's goals, sometimes I think there's a world where you're building things with two different end goals. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people realize that as well. The Bitcoin community may want to build a protocol or a set of infrastructure that lends itself to a market that wants, uh, you know, as, as safe and decentralized a store of value as possible. Whereas the Ethereum community may want to build an actual platform that every, that, you know, is turn complete that can be developed on and that can support, you know, high throughput dApps. Now, again, it'd be reductive to say that's, that's all that either community is trying to do. I, I think my, my point is more so that, you know, there is different sects of the community or at least different users who value the, those two things and, and quite frankly value those two things differently. And so when you think about decisions that even get made between different projects, because I know it can be super overwhelming to understand why is this project doing that? What's the difference from this project and that project? Sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's helpful to think about like what the end goal, what dApps, what dApps, so to speak, or even just more generally what use cases they see happening on these protocols or they see these protocols facilitating um, to understand kind of why they're making the decisions they're making. And I know as an investor, that's something you have to think about a lot um, is sort of where is this team or product kind of seeing value? Where are they seeing the market? And what decisions are they making to get there? Um, and that that can, especially in nascent spaces and technology, it can be really tough. It can be really, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, but um, ultimately you kind of have to plant your flag somewhere. Otherwise, uh, you know, it'll be easy. It's easy to kind of spin your wheels and spend a bunch of time building something that does everything. And, and you know, we rarely see good examples of, of, app, of you know, technologies that emerge that are completely, completely broad. Well, and politics also dictates a lot of how you build some of these systems. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of these, some of these systems are very, you know, socialistic or, you know, they, they're based on more communism ideals. Other systems are like pure capitalism. Um, others are like hybrids of socialist systems and hybrid systems. So like, there's a wide range of political opinion and motivations and, you know, other just kind of, I don't know, more human consensus um, rather than and human opinion based on, you know, how to do those consensus models or how to have certain economic models um, that, you know, kind of dictates the direction of some of these projects. So some of these projects go a certain direction because they believe in a specific political ideology or specific economic system. Um, and then that influences, you know, where that tech is going. So we're still seeing that, like, and those initial philosophical debates of, you know, what system we should use, how we should use it, and then how that dictates the technology, and then how that's built into the consensus mechanisms and actually hard-coded into the actual uh, networks and applications themselves. I agree. I, I think one way I think about it, because there's a lot of in, in the in the blockchain space specifically, there's a lot of dialogue that kind of it it it, it you know lends itself to a binary outcome. It basically says the way this group is doing things is right, the way this group is doing things is wrong. Um, you know, I, I kind of think about think that different groups for these different protocols, projects, or you know even groups within these projects, some of them are just kind of building for different markets. And so, and, and in that in that sense, I actually think there's kind of a difference, and, and maybe that's maybe that's lending to a lot of the interest. There's a difference between what what I think blockchain is as a market, or you know, blockchain is a technology, versus what's happening in VR, AR, and even AI. I, I think that um, going back to how people define kind of disruptive technology, what's happening in crypto and blockchain is disruptive in the sense where it's there's there's few businesses today that have in really really strong kind of business goals that are aligned with uh, you know developing a new crypto protocol. There's definitely some, and there's certain. I mean, it's hard to know um, you know what what what's real and what's not. But there's definitely people spending some time in it at the corporate side. But when you compare it to like how AI and VR, uh, you know, the benefits that they pose for a lot of existing companies. They don't. They don't really match up. I mean, VR, VR rather, and AR in in some worlds just lend themselves really well to like the content and consumption model that a lot of big companies rely on. You know, you can see Apple building an amazing VR headset and selling more devices, and that's one of the things that Apple is really good at doing. You could see Google investing in AI, or they are investing in AI because 
they can serve better search results. They can serve faster search results. You know, there's a really strong ROI for them to do that. I think the, the crypto market's a little different because there's the ROI for big companies is less clear and the ROI in the markets that exist today or the ones that at least are like very clearly defined is a little less clear. And so uh, it, that would be get kind of new markets. Um, and, and, you know, this is something that like, I, I didn't think of this on my own. This is something that another VC kind of shared with me and is, and has been written about a bit and it's really the difference between a disruptive and a sustaining technology. Um, and so my point is that I, when I try to sort of like hold everything happening in the blockchain market in balance, in particular, like different protocols that are ostensibly doing the same thing, I try to think that like some people who are ultimately going to become users are going to value the different features differently. So if you live in a world where, you know, inflation schedules have really hurt you in the past and hurt your ability to transfer wealth and store wealth and, you know, security is a big concern and, you know, censorship resistance is a big concern, then I'm sure you would love a lot of things that Bitcoin's doing and would prefer not to make any trade-offs. Uh, if you live in the world where that's not the case, or maybe you don't realize it's the case, then, you know, it, it feels a lot more, I would imagine you would feel a lot more comfortable taking some risk and, and saying, hey, like making trade-offs on, on some of these things. Or, and, and, it's, and it's not to say that there's necessarily trade-offs that are always going to be true between security and other features, but you, you at least feel comfortable with the risk. You know, the ROI for you is just different. So, um, so I kind of think of it as different markets that are going to emerge and just a different customer set. Um, you know, maybe being the same individuals, but different, you know, different sort of customer use case for these different protocols. Um, at least that's, you know, that's one, that's one possible outcome. And what are your thoughts on ICOs, you know, as a venture firm, you know, is that, are, are you guys investing in tokens? Is that something you're looking at or are you still trying to take a more traditional investment path? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, it's a space that it's funny. I started looking at it, um, really last year, kind of almost, almost exactly a year ago in, um, or rather almost, it might be two years ago now. It was, it was in late 2016. Um, and I, it's been, a, it's been a long time. It was right around the Dow happened. And I, uh, I and, you know, to me, that was huge news and, and pretty monumental. Um, it was after the Dow hack, but also after the Dow had raised and I kind of followed just that whole series of events. Um, and I started spending more time kind of thinking about the impact of ICOs and, and look, I, I, I was, my initial read was that no one was going to invest in ICOs. Like I remember in 2017 thinking like, these are the Dow had literally happened like months earlier. I was thinking like, why would, why would anyone invest in more of these? Um, you know, there's clearly a lot to figure out. Um, but, uh, but I, I, under, I think overall, I underestimated the risk, uh, the risk that folks are willing to take and kind of how comfortable people in the market are with risk. Um, and inevitably, they did take off. And so I, I quickly did an about face and kind of my, my call. Um, but um, but I, I think that since then, we've seen, you know, we've continued to see some things that are probably above the norm in terms of size of ICOs or how they're being run. And then we've seen some companies that are taking approaches that are a little more conservative um, my view is that, you know, I think the space should have a, you should have a healthy level of skepticism when, when looking at any investments in the space. I mean, quite, quite a bit of skepticism, um, just because there's so many projects and there's, and there's, again, kind of going back to our earlier comments, like a lack of standards. Um, however, it makes sense that, uh, characteristics of, within ICOs kind of make a lot of sense for ways to bootstrap a network and, you know, ways to kind of get buy-in. I think there's still a lot to be determined. As a firm, um, you know, we don't have super strong opinions on ICOs. Uh, we haven't participated in one, and I, I don't foresee us doing so in the future. Um, but that's not to say that we're not going to make it, investments in kind of token-enabled businesses or investments in tokens directly. We're open to that. Um, I think the reason I say we might not make them in the future is because I think the landscape regulatory, from a regulatory standpoint from, you know, what's permitted and what's not may very well change. And so, you know, I think the public ICOs that were happening on the internet a year ago, uh, were, you know, probably going to be, be much more reined in. Um, but we, we still, we still maintain a lot of optimism around the, you know, new token models and new potential businesses that can be built with tokens. And, um, you know, I think it's just about kind of finding the right alignment in terms of 
tech, the value proposition, the team, and from an investor standpoint, understanding like how you accurately, or at least certain frameworks you can start to think through to try your best to kind of underwrite to these and to think about the risk, think about the value accretion. I actually think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, you know, in, in, in that space from an, from an investing standpoint. There's some great work that's, that's been done already, uh, but I think a, a lot more work you know, can be done and, and should always be done by, by investors. And we're on the Hacker Noon podcast. So what is a time in your life when you had to hack something? Yeah, I mean, I've had to hack stuff all the time. I mean, I, I, uh, every, learning to code and building apps has been, you know, a, a, because I didn't come from a computer science background, uh, you know, formally through my education, has been a lot of hacking and just, you know, spending, spending a lot of trial and error and a lot of, uh, a lot of time on Stack Overflow. Um, but I think the, 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 the times I hack things most regularly, so I actually have kind of a, a rare um, condition with my eyes that kind of gives me a certain type of uh, color blindness that can make it a little hard to, um, you know, see certain things in computers. And it can also kind of just make like reading stuff on the web that's in all sorts of colors a little difficult. And so I've gotten really good at like hacking a lot of um, the display interfaces that are in uh in a lot of computers and uh, you can, you can do a lot on Mac, but I've gotten like pretty, I, even in, in past, you know, in past times I've gotten good at doing it on more like permission systems um, just because it, 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 it's so helpful. And I think that to me, you know, that's one of the things I love about tech is that, you know, hacking can be super fun to build something to be creative, but it can also be like incredibly helpful for people with disabilities or people who, you know, might, uh, might just have a harder time consuming media or consuming information through other formats. And so I, I like to spend time kind of diving into accessibility hacks. I think that's just like a super fun space. Apple does a great job of featuring a lot of those uh, and, and kind of, you know, although they're not the most open platform, they do a good job of getting ahead of that by creating, you know, a lot of different, um, you know, little hacks that a lot of people don't know about for accessibility that I think are pretty cool. And uh, what are some of your final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we talked a lot about a bunch of different spaces, emerging mm -hmm. tech generally, I'd say, from, uh, you know, ER, AR, to AI and blockchain. Um, you know, I, I think for me, given my background, spending some time developing and also spending a lot of time looking at these spaces, uh, I, I think it's really important that if you're a hacker, if you're a developer, you balance sort of, excitement that you have around a new technology around you know a new potential problem to solve with the you know opportunity in the market and kind of building a sustainable business it's something that i've learned kind of through marrying those two experiences as a vc and spending some time as a developer uh you know really uh, if you build one without the other if you have a great business plan or you know you have some amazing idea but it's not feasible technically then you know, you're not going to get very far. And I actually think the inverse is true. If you can build amazing tech, but if, if you haven't thought through kind of the, the market for it or, you know, the value proposition it offers, whether it's a market we're used to or whether it's a completely new market that, you know, doesn't mimic anything today. Uh, if you, if you haven't made a call on that side of the business, you know, that can be really, uh, that, that can make your life very challenging as well. And so, yeah, I think that it has sort of kind of comes to mind when you, when you mention that it's like an amazing world changing technology, but they never really figured out a business model for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, you know, look, I mean, uh, man, I am so grateful for, for so many efforts on, on the web that, that didn't necessarily have business models and didn't have, um, you know, didn't have, uh, or, or even stuff that's like more open, just open source stuff. I'm a huge fan of that. So that's, that's not to, you know, diminish any of those efforts. But, um, but I think that in particular, if you are, you know, from my, from, from my lens as an investor and as a VC, um, what I've realized is that you, you know, it, it really, there is an onus, especially if you're kind of entering the markets today in VC. And I think we're seeing some of that in, in the crypto and blockchain space where people are starting to ask, okay, where's the value creation? Where's the value proposition? Like, why is this valuable inherently? And, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, it's always going to be, I think that'll be a question in the foreseeable future for a lot of tech. And so, you know, answering those things as a hacker is, is, is quite important, or at least spending some time on it is important. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Where can people find you? Great. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm very active on Twitter. You can find me under Julian Moncada NY. That's J-U-L-I-A-N-M-O-N-C-A-D-A. 
NY. Uh, my DMs are open, so feel free to you know follow me, hit me up, and happy to talk about anything. Cool. And is there any particular things that you're investing in or looking at right now in the space? So if there's someone listening to this that's working on a startup, is there you know is there anything you know specific that you're looking for right now that they should reach out to you for? Yeah, I'm you know still digging really heavily in the in the in the blockchain and crypto space we've talked about. And one of the things that's getting me most excited, uh, kind of going to some of the themes of the conversation, are companies that are enabling that store of value use case today in the world. Um, and so examples of that are uh, an investment we did in a company called Casa, which is offering kind of storage and custody and security and different solutions around that. Um, we similarly have an investment in a company called Abra that lets uh, individuals invest, leveraging kind of the Bitcoin blockchain um, to allow them to invest basically in a variety of different types of crypto assets. And, uh, you know, if you think about replicating the different systems we have for our traditional stores of value in the world today, I think there's a lot of opportunities. And so folks that are building, you know, other products, they could be around uh, transactions, around POS, building stuff on the Lightning Network, building, you know, products that are more financial in nature on the, you know, around Bitcoin or around kind of crypto are super interesting to me because I think there's a direct revenue opportunity for those right now. And there's also a lot of innovation to come. Awesome. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. Awesome. Thanks for having me. This concludes another episode of the Hacker Noon podcast. I'm your host, Trent Lipinski. Please don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes and YouTube and follow us on social media. You can also find us at hackernoon.com and podcast.hackernoon.com for more episodes. Thank you for listening.